thanks for coming. We are going to be talking about how I approach performing pretty much any song from the real book. I know that many of you think to yourself, how do I take a lead sheet and turn it into an actual performance? So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight. No, actually, I'm going to give you a lot of insight into how I do that. It may not be the only way to do it, but I definitely learned over the years that there is things you can absolutely do with any song from the real book to turn it into something that is performance worthy. I'm pretty sure all of you who are members of the Jazz Mental channel or have joined us on jazzmental.com, at some time or other, you probably thought to yourself, how do I get my music out into public? How do I turn something into a piece of music or a performance that is worthy of an audience? And that's really the goal. It's not just to keep music to ourselves. It's to share music with other people. So that's what we're going to do here. I have no idea how many of you there are going to be here. But what I can tell you is, even if it's one of you, you can ask me anything you like as we go through this tutorial. It's not really a tutorial. It's sort of my thought processes as I approach music. And sometimes I think it's important to hear that from somebody that's not yourself. Yeah, I mean, we all have our own way of doing things. Some people approach the real book differently than these other people. And I think everybody does it differently, but there are sort of common things that you should look out for when you're performing a jazz standard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the music itself. You know, the good part about this is we're starting kind of from zero. I haven't really spent much time with this particular song, which is the song for the evening. Now, at some point, we may switch to another tune just to try some ideas out. But for the most part, we're just going to stick with the tune the way you look tonight. Let me just throw that quickly up on your screen here. This is the way you look tonight. And I have it um, open on another screen, but I can actually mark up this screen a little bit and let you know a little bit about the process that we're going to go through. So that's, you know, I think something that everybody wants to do is just open up a sheet of music from the real book, tackle it, see where it goes, find some ideas, and turn it into music. So wherever you are in the world, thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Here it's Sunday evening in Canada. I'm in a place called Niagara on the Lake. This is my home. Welcome to it. I know you can't see all of it, but I have a nice view of the forest here behind me, which is kind of nice. And the, the piano is sitting here for now. We're going to move it into the studio pretty soon, which we're almost finished renovating and it'll be ready soon. So as I go through this process, again, just ask me anything you like. Let's go back to the tune and take a look at, yes, Nancy. They want it louder? I don't know if I can, but I'll try. All right, that's as loud as I can get it, Nancy. I apologize if it's not loud enough. Uh, is it absolutely that they can't hear me at all, or it just needs to be louder? It's very faint. Okay, well, I can see the audio settings going out from OBS Studio, and it's kind of almost at its max. So that's about the best I can do. So they're just going to have to crank the audio on their end. All right, thank you, Nancy. And by the way, we have my wife, Nancy, monitoring your chat area. So again, we're going to get the questions in real time, and we'll take a look at them. All right, so... Let's get started. Now, this is the tune, The Way You Look Tonight. The first thing is you've got four bars of intro. Anybody can see that. Now, now as soon as I look at a real book, I'm thinking, OK, there is four bars of introduction. Let me just see if I can write this one a little, a little faint. Let me make it a little bit bigger here. 
There we go. So we've got this four bars, which is not the melody. Typically, when you see a lead sheet, melody starts at A. First thing, obviously, we notice it's in the key of F. Let's not, be, let's not deal with minutia. Let's just kind of deal with the tune. So the very first thing that I do is I just open the thing up, and I take a look at the basic chords, and I just start playing. So let's do that. We've got 4-4 four, four time. It says medium up swing, but that's debatable. I mean, you can play this tune pretty much anyway. We're going to start it as a ballad. So let's do that. And then I think we can do the introduction again because there was a repeat sign, maybe do it a little bit differently. And at this point in my brain, if there is an introduction, I pause. Give the audience an opportunity to feel like there's something coming, but just let it hang there a little bit until, the, until you want the audience to sort of feel the melody. Right, so I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I mean, those chords are okay. But as I play the tune through, what I'm thinking to myself is, do I remember this melody from before? Have I ever played this song before? Have I ever heard it before? And the answer is yes. So if I'm looking at it with uh, new eyes, new space, new time, we're Sunday evening, April the 16th, how do we make something new out of it? And yeah, you can mess around with the chord symbols all you like, but the reality is those chord symbols, no matter how many different types of voicings, for example, you, you could do F, min F major seven to D minor seven a million different ways. Right? There's many different types of uh, inversions, many different types of voicings, whatever. But that's not how my brain usually works. The first thing I'm looking at is where are we going? It's kind of like the same thing in life. It's like if you don't know where you're going, <laughs> you'll sort of end up somewhere else. We don't want to end up somewhere else. We want to end up where the song dictates we should end up. And that last chord of a phrase or that last chord of a two-bar section or a four-bar section or the entire A section, whatever that last chord is, getting there is the most important part. It's not the destination that matters. It's how you get there that matters. For example, I once went to Brockville on a vacation. And I told people, I said, where, where did you go for vacation? And I said, I went to Brockville. And I was like, oh, that's too bad. Because, you know, by car, it's only like five minutes away. But it took me two weeks to get there. It's not how you get there. Uh, it's not where you get that matters. It's how you get there that matters. So let's take a look at the tune and let's think, okay, as the tune dictates where we're going, where is that destination? So just play it again. <laughs> Sorry, to me, that's like a four-bar phrase. <laughs> 
So you've got this note, this chord as the interim destination. And we're going to change it to three because one and three are interchangeable. So let's just do that. This is three minor seven instead of one major seven. So then, so then instead of playing the changes, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out a way to get to there. And if there is other places to get in the interim, we should figure out ways to get there too. So my first thought is, can you throw a 2-5 in front of 3 minor? Sure you can. So if 3 minor is A minor 7, a 2-5 would be, you know, B to E. Maybe B half diminished 7th to E7 because we're going to a minor chord, right? You, you put a minor 2-5 in front of the destination. And then you think, okay, well, if we're going to put a 2-5 in front of that minor chord, why don't we put a 2-5 in front of this minor chord? So, okay, let's do that. Um, no, let's not do that. It's too quick. Give us more time. Let's put a 2-5 in front of this chord, which is G minor. So if we do that, 2-5 would be A to D, so A half diminished 7th to D7, and then you might go cycle a fifth before that, so say B flat. So one, four. Let me just play that without this microphone on so it sounds a little bit clearer. Right? So you see what I did? That's just two bars, right? You're going from one to two. So if this is two minor seven here, you're going from here to here. Do one, four, three, six, two. It's kind of a standard way of getting to two minor. Okay. <laughs> It's always good, even though you're working in chunks, and we're working just on that two bar and four bar section, you gotta keep going a little bit sometimes just to kinda hear where things are going. The ear can discern at chords as they move through by basic sounds. There's minor chords, major chords, dominant chords, but you can also make each one of those more dissonant than they normally are. So let's try a different way of changing the chords up in terms of the actual quality of the chord, not the name of the chord. So for example, if we're going F to B flat to A to D to G, we can change the quality of each of those chords and, and the complexity of each of those chords. So let's try that. This time, instead of doing that 2-5 where we just did there, go to B half diminished seventh to E7 like we've written. Let's try that again. Do you hear the difference there? Let me play those two back to back. And then you can see it's like, you're picking the destination, which is like the A minor 7th chord or 3 minor 7, but we're changing the 2-5 that comes in front of it. Let me play it the first way. <laughs> so 
So that first way is G minor 7 to C7. This time, we're going to go G minor, then to B half diminished 7, then to E7. Sorry, that's the second way. I forgot to play the first way, which is the 2-5. Oh, no, I did play that. Sorry. I did play the 2-5 of F major. Now I'm playing 2-5 of A minor. And you'll notice that even though the melody changes, it's like... You're still following it up with the same chord changes. You're, you're moving the melody backward and forward in time. You're still playing it. You're just not playing it in the same time that it's written. Interesting stuff. Okay. So I just heard from Nancy and I was listening to her ask the question and I'm looking at it now on the screen. It says, when I play seventh chords, and this is from Wick Rick Williams, when I play seventh chords, do you always play four or more notes in the right or do you use your left hand for the seventh and use your right hand for three and five? So I think the key word there is always. And for me, obviously, someone with a bit more experience than many people there's no discerning between how many notes in the left and how many notes in the right it's never the left hand plays three and seven or one and seven and you know chord tones in the left hand and the right hand plays upper structure notes or any kind of altered notes so for me it's more about learning a specific chord change for example two five one of of g here's a specific chord change that is something that I can apply at any time. Let's, let's do another one. That's something that, with experience, you're basically changing everything up at all times. So if you're thinking, well, what's the formula for what he's doing? And the answer is, originally, all I'm doing is I'm picking different chord progressions and different ways of playing those chord progressions and memorizing the way the fingers move. So let's play like five different ways in a row. And again, five different ways. It, it shouldn't be that hard to come up with five different ways of playing a 2 five, one of F. Let, let's try five of them. Again, that's just off the top of my head. It's not, it's not something that is an absolute formula. I think people get the wrong impression. You know, you watch YouTube videos on how to play the ultimate 2-5-1 chord progression, and you think that that translates into every tune, but it doesn't. What happens is you have to learn more than one way to get to your destination chords. And probably the best way to do that and again, I'm, I'm referring to Rick's question is that I'm not, I'm more thinking about scales than chords themselves. So for example, if I look at the scale, G minor seven, I look at the scale for C and then I go to F, I'm pulling notes out of the scale, not out of the chords. There's no formula in that scale. For example, you can play 
the entire scale of G minor with all of your fingers and resolve that. So this is the entire scale. And then if you take all of those notes of the scale and you spread them out, and then go to C7, So that's more of the formula that I would be looking for. It's like, what is the scale? Any note in that scale goes unless it creates a flat nine. For example, if we're in G minor, and all of a sudden I play a flat nine, it's the harshest chord in jazz, really. Or the harshest note is any flat nine that conflicts with one, three, five, or seven. So leave it out. Now, flat nines work really well in dominant seventh chords. For example, so it really depends on the level of dissonance. Just ignore flat nines when you're in minor keys or minor chords. Ignore flat nines when you're in major chords. You get the idea. So try to think beyond the typical play one and seven with the left hand and play three and seven and upper structure notes with the right hand. It's, it's not really like that. It's about learning specific chord progressions. All right, let's go back to the tune. By the way, thank you for the question. I hope that was clear. Any follow-up questions you can certainly ask. I hope you're having a good time. All right, let's keep going. So let's play a little bit more of the tune. Let's go back to this markup that we've got here and just play a little bit more of it and see where we're going. So from the beginning. I think, check one, two. I think it's interesting to take a look at that little turnaround that I did where the melody is like this. When you ever you see something like that, the first thing that should pop into your head is how do I make more of that melody and put a few more chords in there that make that melody sound more outside the key or just a little bit more challenging for the ear because if you just play the standard one six two five that's okay but imagine if you just looked at it like individual notes that you can put chords under that sound a little bit outside of that I 
I think that's kind of the essence of jazz, is to find chords that fit underneath those interim notes, because it's not melody, it's, the melody is this. And then you get that bridge. It's not a bridge, it's just the interim four bars. The reason why it's interim is because those are not sung notes. That's not part of the original tune. If I were a good singer, I'd explain that to you or present that to you or perform that for you. But <laughs> I'm not that great a singer, so it's not going to be that great. But it's like, someday when you're awfully low and the field is wrong. Thinking of you and the way you look tonight, and then it just ends. And you get that interim thing. So as a piano player, thinking, how do I make the most out of those interim notes? So let's play the melody, and then you'll hear it. Right, I think it's important to kind of take a break from all of that improvising to kind of give you some insight into what's going on in my head. Uh, except, for <laughs> except for I have a question according to Nancy. So let me just check the question. So Jake, hi Jake, how you doing? Hi Paul, this is something there is something about modes that's not clicking with me. For I was watching Adam Maness explain that when playing, for example, the sixth in the key of C 
it's better to improvise on the Aeolian mode, which goes from A to A, of course, rather than other modes. Okay. But then he demonstrates with notes on starting on A. So if you're not starting or ending on A, you're just playing notes from C major. What is it then that makes those notes especially Aeolian? <laughs> Sorry about the broken paragraphs. This chat only allows 200 characters at a time. Okay. Well, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So let me just glance at it again and see if I can find the essence of the question. Okay. So, yes, if you're looking at modes, and I want to make sure that my microphone's on. Yes, it is. Okay. So if you're looking at modes, you've got in the key of C, you're going up from C. That's Locrian, then Dorian, then Phrygian, I think, then Lydian, then Mixolydian, and then Aeolian, which is the sixth. Then Locrian? No, wait. Dorian. Uh, what's the seventh one? Somebody help me out. Maybe that one's Locrian. Which really goes to show you that I honestly don't even think that way anymore. Maybe in the beginning when I was first learning jazz, I was thinking, okay, what, what mode do I play over this scale? But the reality is all of them are this C scale, they just start on different notes. So the answer is, I don't think in terms of Aeolian. When I'm in the key of C and I'm playing A minor, I'm playing a C major scale or some type of bebop scale. For example, in the key of C, I might play this bebop scale. The extra note is a C sharp. So now I've got eight notes in the scale instead of seven notes. But I'm never thinking Aeolian, Phrygian, Dorian, Mixolydian. I'm not even, even sure who came up with that, but what I can tell you is, is that I don't think like that. That's not something that enters my consciousness. It's what key am I in in the moment and do the notes of the scale fit inside that key depending on what the chord symbol is that you're using. For example, l let's just for, s for simplicity's sake, let's go to C major. We're going two, five, one. So Dorian to Mixolydian to, what is one called again? It's not Ionian, it's, somebody help me out here. Oh, it's Ionian, yeah. So, so the root is Ionian. Okay, so then to C. Now each of those can have a bebop scale, Dorian, to bebop scale on Mixolydian, to Ionian. And if you're improvising, each of those scales comes into play. a really simplistic way of saying try not to limit your thinking to what scale to play or whether that sounds good or not. Think more about bebop scales and the key of the moment. What is the key of the moment in a 2-5-1 of C? The key of the moment is C. It's not key of D minor, then key of G, then key of C. It's the key of C with 2-5-1 of C. Does that make sense? I hope so. So that, that's my thought process because it's too complicated to think, oh my God, I'm on a, like a sixth of a C major scale. What, what mode should I use? I, I'm not thinking like that at all. I'm thinking more like, how do I make an A minor chord sound good? Then how do I make a D minor chord sound good? So if that was six, this is two. Right? 
six, two, five, one. That's what's going on in my head. I hope that makes sense. So we tend to, as musicians, get stuck into, okay, if we learn the Aeolian scale, it's going to cover this entire sixth of the scale anytime I ever see that. Six minor is going to be Aeolian. That's the only thing we're ever going to play. If you do that, you're going to limit yourself because A minor, for example, as a seventh chord is many things. It's the, the, it's the chord itself. <laughs> So there's a million different things that you can do. Try not to limit yourself to just Aeolian. I hope that helps, <laughs> Jake. Thank you so much for the question. And I just see that you lost my vocal mic, but I managed to turn it back on. It's hard to remember because basically if you play the piano and the mic at the same time, you get this bleed, which doesn't sound that great. So yeah. Okay, and I'm following the chat. I, I'm grateful for those of you that showed up. So let me just take a few minutes and play a little bit more of the tune. And if you hear something, so this is going to be the exercise, right? I mean, we can get into the minutia of what the brain is thinking. I'm, I'm certainly not thinking scales at this moment. I'm thinking more about melody and how that transmits into the tune itself. I'm thinking about different changes as they flow through, but basically I'm just trying to make music. And of course, the questions that you're asking are trying to pare things down to their bare minimum. And I think that's great, but what it all comes down to is just play and see where the music takes you. And if you have, if you're missing some of the technical aspects of what should go in there, your ear will hear something in my playing and then you'll say, what is that right there that you're playing? And hopefully you'll have a question like that. It's like, okay, Paul, I just heard something. It sounded like something, explain, is it, is it part of the A section, part of the B section, whatever. So let me just play a little bit and let's see how it goes. Because you know you can't go too long into the whole thought process. You have to get back to the music at some point, which is really the most fun part. Let's get into it.
I think you can hear I just changed key so we're heading into the bridge which is in a flat so we finished off and and that's you have to think about if the bridge is in a different key you have to figure out a way to get to that key so let me play it again So there, I just did a simple 2-5 of A-flat. If the bridge starts on the third of A-flat, how do you get there? You can get there from coming down or going up. And then change the chords to fit that. So if it's 2 5 1, it's B flat to E flat to A flat. And then just switch your brain into thinking how do I formulate chords that work well under those different notes? Or coming down. or a million other ways. Anyway, so on and so forth, right? Destination, destination is A flat. Find a way to move from C into A flat. That's the goal. And as you finish the head, your mind is thinking, if we're going into the solo, keep the melody in mind as a solo progresses. The changes can move with the solo. They can be standard changes. They can be whatever. Obviously, if you're playing with a bass player, it's probably a good idea to play <laughs> standard changes. And if you don't know what those are, ask the bass player or pull out a chart and say, hey, bass player, play these changes. I mean, it's, it's not something that is obvious, if, especially if you're going to reharmonize and play different notes or different chord changes. Okay, so I'm getting into the solo section. I'm starting to think, okay, keep the melody going in the back of my brain, keep the chords going in the back of my brain, but make new melodies as the solo progresses. If there's anything in here you find interesting, just let me know. <laughs>
just going to check in with some of the live stream going on here. Honestly, I didn't really know how many people would be showing up for this thing. I see that it's not that many, which is good. So we can handle a few questions, which is really good. I think maybe what would be helpful, for example, do you think to have a bit more people on these live streams? Because we've tried a couple of them before. Sometimes we get, you know, like 30 people. Sometimes we get 60 people. I'm just wondering if we just do a better job of scheduling, maybe give more insight into helping me reach more people. That would be pretty cool. I, I like the intimacy because, of course, we can deal with individual questions a lot better. But I'm also looking for, you know, to help as many people as we can help. So if you have any suggestions on what we might do, what's, what's your experience with the live stream, and maybe we can attract a few more people to the live stream and, and handle a few more questions. So in if there aren't any more going forward, and again, Jake, you've been really great. Uh, actually, let me just take a look at the last thing you wrote. If you have one, could you try a cardioid mic such as a Sure or any other mic might be able to leave it on without too much bleed? Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. I just don't have one right now. So maybe we'll try that next time. And uh, I can, you know, right now I can turn it on and turn it off at will. I think it's, it's okay to do that. So we'll figure that out. All right. I'm just going to play a little bit more of this because that's what we're working on. And we've got about 15 more minutes. So if you have any questions about what I'm playing, that's great. I'm just going to keep playing and you can jump in and ask me anything you like as I'm doing it. Actually, let me let me just at this point, as you have played the tune through like several times, we've tried it with different chord progressions. We've tried it with different scales and we've done two fives of this and two fives of that. We've done some reharmonization at this point, as I know the tune well enough and as I've played it a number of times, what's going to start to seep in is what we call inner voices. Try to hear where the inner voices are moving and it's obviously going to be far more effective if you do it like a ballad versus a you know up up tempo tune with bass and drums they're not going to hear inner voices it's really a solo piano concept try to hear where the the notes are moving even around the melody or in between melody notes and as they move on inner voices for example right you just had some movement there Take that concept and try to apply it to music. Just play things really, really slowly so that you can start to hear where things move. You can actually hear inner voices with your, your ears if you really listen to it, like or just where things go. It's just you're, you're changing the quality of the chord as that chord continues. So if we're doing a C7 chord. That was all C7, it's just the chord goes down and then you're adding notes to it. Try to hear that as I play the tune.
Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, wait a second. Yeah, microphone working. So a couple of suggestions on the live stream. Uh, Mark Marcel said, I also think so. I was about to miss this live stream because the email arrived only today. I actually only sent it like 30 minutes ago, so that's cool. I could say for me, I didn't get the email notification. That's true. So basically what you're saying is schedule it. Maybe people will make time for it. That's a good idea. Maybe try having a set time every week. Yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah. So I think Jake said, nice. I, I guess you're talking about the actual tune itself. You know, the reason why I picked this tune, and maybe I should say that up front. Let me just erase all of this stuff that was here. How do I do that quickly? Can I just do it like this? Oh, yeah, erase all. Okay, so the reason why I picked this tune is because it's simple. You've got like 1625, which is the basis of all jazz. But how do you make jazz out of it? How do you make something that's more pleasable to the ear in jazz? And that is some of the ideas that we're trying to capture in this video. Maybe you're thinking, okay, it's a bit random. Maybe you should like do tutorials on a specific 2-5 progression. We have that in the channel. All you have to do is look that up. This live stream is really about this time around just taking a tune and see if we can make something out of it, make music out of it. And we've been an hour and it typically takes a lot longer than that. I mean, if you're going to tackle a new tune, it might take 14 hours or 40 hours or 140 hours or 240 hours. It really depends. It takes what it takes. Work out some decent changes, get some soloing under your fingers and by all means, think about making music because that's really the key. It's about just turning out music that's pleasing to the ear. I was uh, doing a concert not that long ago and for me the entire concert experience is just really about the audience being completely into not just the music itself but into the presentation, into what you say to them, into how you introduce a song, whatever. But music is it's a performance art that is meant to be enjoyed by a lot of people. And as a jazz player, you're trying to not just entertain, give them something they know, but you're trying to turn it into something that's a little more you, a little more authentic in terms of the chord changes. So I, I think you can go to 100 other players on YouTube. You're not going to find anybody that plays like me. It doesn't mean they don't do some of the same things. It doesn't mean they don't play jazz. It doesn't mean they don't, you know, play the same voicing for a two five one chord every now and then. But the reality is, as a whole, as the music all fits together, it's really about just making your own voice. Which kind of brings me to another point. It's like as in the middle of the tune, as you're performing that tune, and that was the way you look tonight, which is a pretty cool tune. If, some, if another tune pops into your head at the same time, bail from the original tune, The Way You Look Tonight, and go into that other tune. And the tune that popped into my head is something that I was playing earlier today, which was Caravan, which my lovely wife Nancy had requested of me yesterday. She was just sitting on the couch naming tunes, and I was like, play Caravan. So I played Caravan. It's something that I hadn't played a long time, so it took me a few minutes to kind of come to terms with what I should do, how I should do it. For example, if you're looking at the tune Caravan. I mean, that might not have been the melody notes exactly, but again, I'm just kind of scrambling to think of it. That's a completely different approach than a ballad like The Way You Look Tonight or a medium swing tune. It's more of like a Latin thing. So you might think to yourself, if you're going to play another tune while working on something, like The Way You Look Tonight, if you're going to throw in another tune, the very first thought should be, what is the feel of this tune? That's the first thing, right? The feel of this one is Latin. So how, how would Latin sound? Pull out some... Latin things that you know in your head that you've learned from other tunes and apply them to this tune. That's what jazz is all about. 
So there's a question from Marcel as I was just kind of riffing on Caravan, which really is just kind of F minor to C7. That's that's really more where my mind goes. And everybody might be thinking, oh, what are the modes and things like that? No, it's just F minor, C7, and there's interim chords in between those things. That's kind of how I'm thinking. Marcel asks, sometimes I feel that besides the basic chords, there can be played some more jazzy chords, but it's hard to find them. <laughs> um, I think I, I said a little bit earlier, how do you find what you call jazzy chords? It's, it's not a single chord that makes it jazzy. For example, this by itself sounds like nonsense unless you resolve it.
One more time. So it's more chord progressions that are more jazzy sounds. And what I mentioned before is whatever notes come out of the scale, use those notes in the chord in any inversion you like. That was just root position. It's just the scale. And if you separated those notes and by intervals, or so just going up the scale, right? I'm just going up the scale in G minor. Actually, we were just doing caravan, so let's do uh, F minor. So let's go here. Right, just notes from the scale. You're just you're spacing them out differently. In this case, let's do force. Not exactly accurate because if you were to do it accurately, it probably wouldn't come out well during a solo. So just try to get them as much as you can. just notes from the scale. Right? That's really what we're trying to do. Jazzy chords is a different voicings for each chord. One chord leads to the next and there's inner voices that make the quality of that chord sound amazing. For example, we're still doing F7, F minor 7, go to B flat 7, going to E major 7. Right, that's a little more modern, but let's try something else. Try something else. Well, right. I think, Marcel, the answer to your question is, is that there's no such thing as basic chords in jazz. In the beginning, yeah, you you have to learn where three and seven is on each of those chords. But as you progress beyond that, you get into scales and the scales dictate where the chord voicings come from. So somebody asks, I, I'm not sure who it is, it's just humor podimus. Humor podimus, okay, cool. How do you voice diminished chords half and whole? So half and whole applies to what we call the diminished scale. You don't voice chords like half and whole. For example, let's say we have a C diminished chord. It's like half whole. There's your half. There's your whole. Half whole. Half whole. Half whole. So the scale is voiced half whole. The diminished chord them itself can take any of those notes and make a voicing out of it. So if you take notes that are not from the diminished chord and you try to put them in like this, it's gonna sound dissonant, but it still works if you take notes out, right? It's all about, can you take notes from the scale and fit them together as a chord that it sounds dissonant, but not too dissonant? That's really the key. So there's no way to voice a half whole scale. It's really just how to voice a C diminished chord. So one way is to take the next inversion. So you can take an inversion of any chord. So this is C half diminished. This is the first inversion, second inversion, 
third inversion. And then what I like to do is that we're taking the second inversion, put on top of the top note a major second, and then duplicate that note in the bass, and then play each of those inversions. Wow, that's cool, right? Again, there's formulas for everything, so I hope that helps. I meant half diminished and whole diminished. What is half diminished and whole diminished? Hmm. Oh, I know what you're saying. You're saying half diminished scale, which is, for example, B half diminished to E7 to A minor. And then you're saying whole diminished, which is, I think, just a whole diminished scale, which is the one we just talked about. So half diminished. So the half diminished just comes out of the original scale. So for example, if we're doing a 2 5 1 of A minor, that's B half diminished to E7 to A minor. So if you want to voice a half diminished chord, because we, we covered the whole diminished chord, if you want to voice a half diminished chord, you have to pick notes out of there that don't clash with the chord tones, which is 1, 3, 5, and 7. So 1, 3, 5, 7. Keep going up in thirds. And if any of those notes clash with the lower notes, which this one does, for example, that's a flat 9, take it out. You can't use C there. Can you use E? Pretty much. Can you use G? So you have the 11th and the 13th available, and then it all depends on how you voice it. For example, go from here to the E half diminished seventh to the A minor. Okay? So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yes, Nancy. No, I just handled it. I just took Humor Potamus's question. Uh, and then Marcel, and I think we're going to end it here because we're like a little bit over our time by like 15 minutes. But Marcel says, could you take a simple church song and develop the chords on it and explain what makes you play certain chords besides the subdominant? I want to know what a jazz player thinks while playing. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can do that in another video i mean that's like a whole subject in and of itself but what i can do is maybe take one example so he wants me to take a church song so So let's do uh, what a friend we have in Jesus, as much as I can recall of it. <laughs> let's see what we can do. So, I mean, just the first part. So, my, my brain is trying to think, okay, what are the actual chords underneath that? And how does the melody note change as the chords change? Or how does the melody note change be 
because the chords change. And I'm just trying to figure that out in my head right now. So it's going to four, so we have to get to four. So I'm doing a two five of B flat. So I'm starting in F, and then a two five. then it's doing a three six two five of one so one to four and then I'm throwing in a fifth below so from B flat to E flat and then a three six five what's the melody So instead of doing three, six, two, five at the end, I'm doing going down in half steps. So one more time. One, then a two, five, a four. Then the dominant. Then to three. So, I mean, we could spend all day going through a billion different um, versions of what a friend we have in Jesus, but I hope that <laughs> answers your question. Thanks so much for it. Hey, listen, folks, that's all uh, the time I have for tonight. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. My name is Paul Toby. If you like this video, <laughs> it's a good idea just to reach down and give it a thumbs up. That would really help us here on the channel. And let me just... Uh, Say, if, you, if, if you're here for the first time and you want to subscribe to the channel, that'd be super cool as well. So let's finish this off. I'm just going to uh, play you out, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it.